for everyone's good. So this is a, a smaller group, so if you have some questions as I'm going through it, it's, you know, it's pretty ridiculous, right? So journey to the cloud. I have some slides that kind of just set the context, but you all know that the data center and just data depositories are just so strategic to whatever is going on. People are trying to access from the edge into a central depository the data and information they need for the business. And just a couple of factoids here. You know, three quarters, of, three quarters of you are already using some type of cloud technology today, either a cloud service or technology in your environment. I think in 2014, three quarters of you will look at implementing private clouds out there in the marketplace, right? So this whole IT as a service cloud story, virtualization of cloud story resonated. Half of you would like to put in VDI almost as soon as you can in terms of what's driving this, right? And then you look at what's going on with just the amount of connected devices out there for, 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 the, for the business in terms of you're going 13 billion to 50 billion and zettabytes, which is, I think there's a billion terabytes in a zettabyte. So it's a lot of stuff, okay, it's big, all right? And these are projections in terms of everything that comes from the edge is gonna drive a bigger depository in that center, right? So we believe the data center you know, is, is really at the heart of this thing. And we'll see a lot of different transitions and, and things going on in our industry. I can tell you, I spent a lot of time in, in Silicon Valley. Most of the venture capital money is in and around some technology that's in the center of this thing. You know, whether it be software-defined networking or new startups, database technology is kind of hidden out there because people are looking at new ways to construct data and that kind of thing. So, you can tell if you follow the money. And there's a little more money out in the valley than there has been in a while, which is good. It's actually good for the American economy and good, good for everybody. But we believe it's at the center. So when we look at the challenges our, our customers have, I always try to look at it from the technological side and from the business side. You have all these things coming out at you in terms of the devices you have to support, you know, cloud technology, all those things. And, most IT professionals are real good with the technology. They're comfortable with that. They can do that. It's the business drivers that, that are tough, right? Because they change so much. And, and the people asking for the services sometimes don't know what they want or don't they want, know how it's going to enhance the business. So again, you have to become business consultants as, as much as, as IT professionals. And that's, that's what Cisco is trying to do. If you remember one thing that I say here today is I will tell you our investment in development every dollar, especially in the data center group, is aimed at operational transformation. I mean, any product we develop, and we're, we're, we much have a much better process at Cisco, I'd say over the last four or five years for this, is if we can't create some operational transformation, you know, we're not gonna make, we're gonna make a decision not to do it. Because if you were at Cisco 10 years ago, if we could stick a chicken salad sandwich pack, a chicken salad sandwich in an IP packet, we would do it, right? Because we thought everything belonged in the network. We're a little more pragmatic about the approach now, but we're looking at operational transformation. So if we can't reduce cost, reduce headcount, make it easier, we're not gonna develop it. We're not gonna do it just for a slick piece of silicon or an ASIC or that kind of thing. And that's, that's been a big change at Cisco in terms of the way we practically bring products to market. So if you remember that one thing, you know, our innovation dollars are really spent on, on operational transformation. So when we look at when we look at budgets for IT, they're certainly remaining flat, and then you have a lot of demand and a lot of projects to fulfill. And you know, what's the answer to this? You can see I'm building to, to what goes on there, but that's where the gap is today. We have, uh, from Gartner, they believe, and I've had actually had CIOs and IT people correct me that it's actually higher than this, but really three quarters of the time, most of the activity and budget dollars are spent keeping the lights on, keeping the status quo, you know, what you're doing. And a very minimal time is spent on new projects and such. Is that fair assessment? Not good, good? Too high, too low? I, I never get a chance to beat up Gardner. They just beat up us, so it's, it's, it's always kind of fun if I tell them their data's wrong. All right? But most people think that's pretty close. They spend a lot of time in the status quo versus new projects. 
So if we look at the spend in the data center, and we believe about 44% of the IT spend is in the data center, half of it, you see is the, the larger quadrants over here, are spent on software and people to run the data center. In terms of, you know, that percentage, almost half of that spend of the 44%, so it's, it's considerable. And if you double click on servers, even with the virtualization VMware effect, right, you can see the price of servers has actually come down. Even power and cooling has remained fairly constant, but the cost to manage virtualized service has gone up. So what do we believe, you know, some of the solution or some of the answer to this? And that's delivering, you know, IT as a service. Can we, can we have something that's agile, meets the business demands, there as you need it, that whole story, right? Whether it's an internal private cloud, a public service or not. And we're spending a lot of time on, on this particular area. I actually like the way it's depicted on this slide. And really, I think it's driving virtualization to the cloud and the different types of clouds that we have out there. Whether you can go hybrid or public, should be private or public or in the middle or hybrid. I can tell you the debate or one of the debates looming uh, in the valley now is when you talk about hybrid clouds and, and interoperability and that, so as VMs can move across different infrastructures, you know, how, how is it all gonna play out? And I, I think there's still a lot of speculation. But I think that the two approaches are either stack-based, in terms of software stacks, where you load similar software and you have services, or really protocol-based. You get to a certain protocol standard, a certain presentation on the wire, someone else matches it, and you can go to the next level. Similar to wireless today. You know, different speeds and securities you go up versus vertical stacks at the end. I think smart money says it's probably going to be a combination of both. But this whole public and private cloud interaction in terms of hybrid cloud, obviously a big topic in the industry. I will tell you, most customers will tell, will, will tell me, if a service was out there, and I'm going to use um, a retailer, Toys R Us, as an example. Toys R Us does 50% of their business between November, uh, the day after Thanksgiving and Christmas of the year. Right, but they have to buy infrastructure, right, for those for that for that peak time. They would have to spend half the cost on their infrastructure that if they only had to buy for those pre, that previous time. But they have to buy for peak because that's their peak season. If there was a service out there that said, "Hey, when I hit my peak season, whatever it is, and Toys R Us is seasonal, but there's, there's spikes and challenges for everyone's business, and I could go to a public service, and I could." penetrate into that service with my security profile, all the things I needed to do, my storage SLAs, everything I need, ratchet that service up, and then when I come back down below my threshold, that provider gives me a bill for what I spent, and it all worked, I would, I'd, I'd sign up for that right now, if it worked as advertised. And that's really what the industry wants to go to. If you look at some of the cost-benefit analysis, most people say, hey, I don't want to go all out, I'd like to keep some organic for my core stuff, but spike and go out and then ratchet back down and deliver that service. So this whole hybrid cloud interaction. And, and that's certainly what we're working on with Cisco along with a lot of providers to deliver that. But that's you know, kind of the vision. Is that a fair statement you know, of my little example? If that was a depiction, would that be something you would look at? Fair? Yeah. I mean, most people would, right? So you don't have to buy for peak, poor, and you don't have to spend those extra dollars and you're fairly elastic. Right, and usually maybe it's based on demand, which may be good for your business anyway, right? Because you, you, your financial services are selling more, you're trading more, whatever it is. Right, so this whole hybrid cloud area, I think, will get very hot. So we have a concept, what we call Cisco Divine, the Defined Cisco Unified Data Center, and really we like to look at the the technology from a physical, virtual cloud perspective. And one point I want to make here is, uh, I talked about virtual servers, and when you talk to most CIOs, they'll say, hey, we're 60%, 70%, 80% virtualized. I'll tell you, when we get the SEs and even some of the people within that customer, it's usually around 
pops. My point is, there's a ton of bare metal out there. There's a ton of non-virtualized environments, right? So it's so important to handle the physical and the virtual workloads. And there could be some application dependency as to why there's still bare metal, whatever it is, but there's like really a lot of it out there. So it's so important that we don't forget about the physical workloads because they're still there. And we have three kind of pillars for this. We call it unified fabric, unified compute, unified management, which we'll talk go into. But I'll just stop for a second. Any questions or thoughts before I move on? We're good? So unified fabric, we'll go through the portfolio. This is, our, in Cisco's terms, this is our switching line. We're really adding services like FCOE, meaning being able to service both storage and compute and network attributes from, from one fabric. So I'll talk about just unified fabric or FCOE for a second. We have technology that you know, puts two connections per server, you know, primary and a backup. Most enterprise class data centers have either five or seven connections in it. It's usually two to the LAN, two fiber connection, two fiber channel connections to the SAN, and one for management. And if it's in a cluster, two more to the cluster. So it's either five or seven. So we're trying to bring that five to seven down to two with a leading edge portfolio in that in that, in that space. So and don't forget, we're the guys that sell ports for a living. That's what Cisco does. We sell network ports. I'm telling you to use less ports. Because what can be done, what can be done, and will, will be done in terms of this business. So we've already made that decision. We actually made that decision going on, going on seven, eight years ago in terms of unified fabric. Right. And I always say, you know, is unified fabric ready for, for prime time? And I'll talk about UCS, which is going to be a two billion dollar business for Cisco. <coughs> you know, if you have a, a UCS chassis and you're and you're talking to a SAN via fiber channel, you're running unified fabric whether you want to or not. You couldn't stick a fiber channel HBA in there if, if you wanted to. I mean, so it's out there. Brocade didn't buy foundry and go into debt to do it, which is a problem for a high tech company unless they needed an Ethernet solution. Right? So certainly unified fabric is taking off. Unified compute, we'll talk further about it. What really has changed it in terms of the way we do things, you know, in terms of uh, a stateless environment. With our environment, you could run a Windows Suite 8 to 5 and a 501, run a Lin run the Linux suite for a totally different, totally different job different part of the world and do it easily because we have the extraction layer with UCS. Unified management, we have a product called UCS Manager, comes with our product and we've built up a stack for intelligent automation based, based on some acquisitions we made and we still have to, we do a lot with an open ecosystem that you'll see us invest more in that space for, for unified management and we're pretty excited about the solution we have today. So this is uh, our, our switching portfolio, our unified fabric portfolio. I'm not gonna get into you know, every product here, but I could start you at a switch in software right in the hypervisor. So the Nexus 1000V is a software-based switch that runs under VMware. Actually, we'll have a release for Hyper-V later in the year. So I could start you in software and take you all the way to the end of the row with a high-density 10 gig, 40 gig switch with the Nexus 7000. Fill in the gaps for top of rack with our 2K, 5K. I can even put blades in the IBM blades, Blade Center. I can put fixes in the HP Blade Offering. So I can go the full gamut in terms of data center switching with our Nexus product line, same operating system. I can also give you a fiber channel director, scaling all the way up from switch to director, running the same Nexus OS. So one operating system across the whole platform. You'll actually see native fiber channel on our Nexus switches. It's already there in the 5K in the next release of the line cards for the 7K. So this has been some of the uh, market share traction in terms of where we are with 10 gig in the data center moving forward, and it's been a, it's been a, it's been a good market for us. I would even argue the HP that's on the on the chart there. Most of that stuff we don't believe was sold in the data center, where HP has done. Some things is more in the campus environment. So from a 10 gig and up perspective, it's been, you know, very, we've been leading the way, basically because of the software services and unified fabric for, for Nexus. 23,000 customers running the Nexus OS. And the one reason I want to bring that up as well is that started as our SAN operating system, which now evolved to the Nexus operating system. 
So it's a purpose-built operating system for the data center or shitless upgrades and that kind of thing, but I'm not giving you brand new code. It's been out there for a while and tested and evolved. UCS, and this is our unified computing platform in terms of what's happened in the industry. Uh, a lot of people um, didn't think we, we could do this at Cisco. So we announced the product in March 2009. Those of you who remember March 2009, uh, it was bad economically, as you can remember, right around that time. It was, it was, it was a tough time. So, this is not only a new uh, product, but a whole new market space for us with competitors that have been in the you know, compute market for 30, 40 years. And a lot of the components were you know, industry standard. We used Intel processors, memory, industry standard disks, those type of things. And people said, hey, you know, Cisco, what are you doing? Why, why are you going into the space? So if you remember, the economy recovered that summer. And I can tell you where we made a mistake. We thought our problem was going to be you know, getting in injected into customers. We really thought y'all were going to say, hey, Cisco, stick to the plumbing. I got Dell, IBM, IBM, you know, HP. You know, don't need you for servers. You know, see you later. And it was really the exact opposite. Our customers told us they didn't see a ton of innovation in x86 in a while. You've been a great vendor for us. I don't know if I'm ready to buy it, but I'll take a look at it and see, and see what the value is. So really, our problem was getting, you know, here and smart SEs and people that knew the, out there to do the POCs and testing you know, to get to the people that wanted to talk to us. So as it ramped up that summer and into the fall, we started to get traction on certain things of product. So, so people uh, now, it's a $2 billion business for us as we move into this year. And if it's not a $2 billion business for us, we'll certainly be seeing someone else with Cisco next year. <laughs> but um, you know, it's certainly not a science project for Cisco and a really a uh, big part of what we're trying to do in the data center. And the reason I'm, I'm emphasizing that is uh, a lot of our competitors paint a picture that we're not in this for the long term. I'm telling you we are. This is certainly my life, and I'm telling you we have a whole plan about being in this for the long term. Uh, for UCS, and again, it, it's, it's a big business, you know, just stand alone that it is. So, so why, why are people gravitating for us? How does, how does it help you with some of the data center economics and cloud and all those different things? Well, the first two things we talked about were we embedded the network elements into the chassis, right? So with those two connections I talked about. We also developed a piece of silicon, an ASIC from Cisco, that enabled you to double the size of memory using industry standard DIMMs. And typically, memory was the constraint for virtualized infrastructures, the amount of VMs per server or amount of virtual desktops you could support per blade were usually memory driven. So we were able to, to scale that. I will tell you though, we like to talk about those things from the hardware perspective, the memory, and the embedded network, but really it was what we did with service profiles that really put us over the top, and that's where the most stickiness is in terms of our installs today. The ability for IT professionals to keep their operating model intact, whether it's storage, security, network, and maintain that operating model and still be able to provision servers quickly and get it out from a, from a stateless environment. And really that's been the key difference because we look at it from the network point of view. And that's where we're getting the, the most stickiness. So I had a CIO and I said, hey, how are your different silos in your organizations you know, relating to virtualization and U UCS? The gentleman quickly corrected me and said, they're not silos, they're cylinders of excellence. They're not silos. So I always try to remember that one. But really, how do I maintain that operating model? in that cylinder of excellence, because we're not one that says, hey, you gotta knock that down. There's a lot of really good work being done in that, that silo, if you will, because that's why it is a silo. Security is important, storage is always important. You know, all the different things you need to have are important. But again, then again, I needed to bridge the gap to those things so I could get servers up quickly. And, and that's what we think we've done a lot with UCS and the service profile approach. In terms of management, like I said, we have the UCS manager, but we made two acquisitions at Cisco that are a big part of this. One was called Title Software, and they make an orchestrator and a scheduler, and that's part of our whole workflow engine in a product we call CIAC, or Cisco Intelligent Automation for Cloud. And the other one was a company called NewScale, which really developed the front end portal, right? And, and the whole portal concept in terms of you know, picking and choosing what you want to provision you know, in your cloud. So the combination
combination of these two software products and, and, some, and some organic DNA from Cisco is what we call CIAC, and, and that's what uh, we'll talk a little further about. And also, we made an acquisition for the network orchestration, which we call NSM, which was an acquisition uh, from Linesight. The other thing I want to mention is, you know, UCS Nexus, these are open platforms. We have an organic solution here for IA, but, um, you know, if you're predisposed to, to something else, obviously we're going to work in that environment. You know, but we do have an opinion if you don't in terms of what's happening. So what we're, what we're doing on our private cloud initiative at Cisco's called Cities, we're really trying to take this manual process in terms of provisioning servers, you know, from design to when we get it out, from weeks really down to minutes. And that's what we're doing with, with our IA suite in terms of, and we're not afraid to get into benchmarks and demo this in terms of what's happening, really get this down to, to something a lot more manageable where you can be a lot more flexible with your server provisioning. So we believe when we look at these across the platform, we do, we do believe we change the economics in the data center. And we're not afraid to, to get into it in terms of, hey, if we say we're going to have this type of cost savings, or we're going to be able to do backups quicker, or we're going to be able to get servers out the door quicker, we're not, we're not afraid to, to get into those benchmarks. Here's a couple that we've had from customers whether it's a school district, you know, a big carrier. We have, we have dozens of these in terms of where they truly picked up cost savings for our store. I want to highlight one customer here. This company called Travelport. We're down in Atlanta. Travel port is when you go to the airport, you scan your boarding pass, it goes back to their database. All right. What's interesting about travel port is they truly were able to move, it's actually the same people that were doing operational work because of installing UCS, they were able to take those same people and put them on jobs and application and, and you know, jobs and duties closer to the business. Really take them out of the mundane and move them to high level, high energy type you know, uh, jobs in terms of helping the business. And it was actually the same people. I went down and met them and actually took them out to dinner. So it was, it, was, it, was, it was cool because when you talk about different things, you say, how do we move full time equivalent you know, hours and move it into stuff that's closer to the business? This really happened at Travel Port. There's about 53 pods in that environment. They were running IBM rack servers before. They couldn't have done you know, the economies of scale without, without UCS and what we did with Nexus. And this is a business where you're getting paid fractions, fractions of a penny per transaction. That's how they make money. So the, the infrastructure has to be ready for that. Certainly we're not doing this alone. And we're here with, with, with NetApp today. Um, Cisco's always been open ecosystem approach and I know we're going to talk more about FlexPod, which is great, you know, what we call converged stack or smart solution from Cisco, but certainly not doing this alone. Whether it's across the major operating system players, vertical markets, it, it's, it's an, open, an open platform with a lot of ecosystem partners. I know we're going to hear from Sean more about FlexPod, but really the attempt here is to take you know, the, you know, the best of breed in terms of VMware virtualization software, Cisco for network and compute, and NetApp for storage, and put it into a converged infrastructure. Take some of the configuration management and the things that you need to do into a validated design so you can focus on the application. And I don't want to steal Sean's thunder, he'll get into the me mechanics a lot of this, but we're seeing People really want to consume technology this way. Not by the piece parts, by the solution. So that you can focus on the higher level work in your environment. <clears throat> so we believe we, we simplify the journey to the cloud with some of the technology I talked about, whether that be private, 
whether that be public or whether that be hybrid. Um, Cisco is, is, is committed really to being an arms dealer to, to, this, to, this, to the cloud environment, meaning you know, we're selling to enterprises, supplying our solutions to enterprises, and also supplying the solutions to, to the service provider community as well. So we're working on different techniques to say, hey, you know, if you're buying enterprise class solutions from Cisco, when you go to the ancillary market, in the service provider market, you should get a benefit from it. And we're doing the reverse with the service providers. We're saying, hey, as you build out your infrastructure, most of the enterprises may be running our, our infrastructure, and you'll be able to target solutions for those customers. Right? And that's where we're like to get into this discussion of protocols or stacks and how all that works. We're going to try to play both ends of the spectrum as, a, as an arms dealer has been our strategy uh, to do that. We're not going to get into the business of offering platform uh, or infrastructure as a service ourselves. You know, we're going to deliver that to, to our service provider partners. All right, sure. One question. Uh, maybe you can give us an insight onto, onto Cisco's direction as far as enabling that hybrid cloud model, right, from you know, connectors and things like that, on how, how to do it. Yeah, well, um, Harry brings up a point. So we're, we're going to do it with with different software, I mean, you know, there's a, a project we have called Project Kumo, in terms of you know, how we're gonna orchestrate each side of the stack so we can have the right information you know, transposed into the cloud. Some of it we're working on the standards bodies with, some of it we're gonna make a standard and then try to add value to it as well. So it's a, it's a more involved discussion in, term, in terms of that, but as you can, as you can imagine, uh, a key part of what we're trying to do in the business for service providers and enterprises. <laughs> Any more questions? Uh, in the beginning, you touched a little bit on the um, PC investments in, in this in the DM space. I know I started with Cisco to the point down point that how we're trending and what we should look at to win. Um, so we go to bed and I see less than a lot of the sort of basic modules that you always like. What, what do you see? Um, and what are you doing right now to sort of uh, evolve as a DM as it relates to your investments in cloud use case, specifically for PMC? Okay. So, we announced the uh, beginning of our SDN story back in June at Networkers, if, if, if any of you were there. The question was uh, really around how Cisco going to play uh, in the software-defined networking area. Can get that? Okay, so we announced uh, SDN, or our, our beginnings of SDN, at our Networkers conference in June. So we're kind of hitting it on three parts. Number one, we call it Cisco's open network environment, or Cisco One. We believe software is going to be a part of it, not all of it. But we believe there'll be hardware, custom ASICs in, in the whole solution. But there's three pieces we announced and are actually shipping now. Um, one is a, a controller, uh, so OpenFlow controller we'll have. One is a developer's kit we call 1PK. And the other one is enhancements to the Nexus 1000V, which is that software switch I talked about, right? So I'll have, we have it for VMware. It'll actually be an option in the new 5.1 release for um, 5.3 release for you know either their virtual switch or ours. We'll have it for Hyper-V and KVM and Zen as well. So there's a common you know, platform around it. Um, an early adopter is we have a major social media company using the 1PK, right, to, to because they wanted, initially wanted access to the source code, you know, to really get deep in from a network management point of view, but they found it was much better to deal with the developer's kit as long as they could do the function they want. This particular function is on flows and network management in a, in a you know, massively scalable kind of social media uh, environment. And so they're actually programming, this is Nexus 3000s, um, to take advantage of that. So our answer to SDN, and there'll be others, is called Cisco One Open Network Environment. And you'll see us you know, enhance that all the way through. But software will be part of it. You know, not, there's a whole flow in terms of you know, what we'll do with custom software. He said, uh, "Journey to the cloud is getting off. Part of it is getting off the crap you're on now." Yeah. I just want to make sure I didn't ever mention. Uh, you know, I think no one is arguing that you would, this is exactly what you would do, or something like this. If you would want to make the Greenfield side, you build it up this way. So I think that the reality that a lot of people face is, you know, hundreds of legacy systems, legacy operating systems with varying degrees of ownership, with you know, within your company or whatever. So, do you have any insight on? Things 
Well, that's a fair question. So there are a lot of different, you know, kind of, uh, you know, migration techniques, which are quite frankly very tough, right? So what we try to do is really look for the right injection point as to how to do it. So in other words, if you have an environment and you just need, say, if, you know, if you have 40 pods and you need another two pods of capacity, you know, for a certain app that you're running, you know, you might not want to change. You just can't change out of your operational environment. So where do you look for the injection points, you know, either from a new app or a new way to run an app to say, hey, I want to bring this new infrastructure up. Right, so the, the three that we see out there, number one is VDI, right? Usually it's a new set of infrastructure to support VDI. And that's a good place to say, hey, this set of infrastructure, I can get into this new world platform and bring up VDI and go through that whole solution set. That's one. Enterprise, enterprise private cloud is the other. To say, hey, I have my legacy apps, but I want to move, you know, start moving new stuff into this, you know, where I'm delivering IT as a service and, and delivering an enterprise private cloud type services. We see a little too now with risk migration. I mean, applications coming off Spark Solaris, HPUX, you know, AIX, to say, I got to move these, right? And, and, and really, from uh, from what uh, you know happened with Oracle's purchase of Sun, there's not a lot of, not a place to go unless you're going to go full blown exadata, you know, which is only one application. You know, how do I move those over? And I can start fresh in that environment, moving that app over, right? So there are three ways we find the right injection point to do it. There's other ways, but I've we, we try to focus on where's the logical entry, you know, so where you can do it. Um, and usually we're involved in some of the network infrastructure as well, but you know, from an app or things, that, that's, that's what we do. Now, that's the answer I have in terms of a more macro view. It took more to some of the technical guys, maybe a, a better answer closer to the ground. But that's what we try to do is try to find the right injection points so you can start and lose you that. And um, even with UCS, they say it's a $2 billion business for us now. Some of it say, hey, I'm going to try it with SharePoint and Exchange. And now we're into the big ERP jobs and that kind of thing as we prove ourselves along the line. Fair answer? Yeah. How do you migrate? Right, so the question was more about the resources and the, and the people, right, in terms of how they, they migrate over. And, and, and that's another great question, because that, that's, that's key, right, in terms of what, you know, what really happens. Now, you know, I've got to be frank, some people ain't going to make it if they're just going to be, you know, mundane in their job and, you know, <laughs> not going to be flexible like some, that way. But we, we usually, in terms of how you manage the people skill thing is a big issue. So we do some things with our services team around organization. It actually really started too when you, when you injected virtualization. You put your first you know copy of ESX out there. It was like wow, you know this we're having VMs move around. The storage guys need to know that. The networks guys, you know what VLANs that can be on. What's the firewall provisioning? What what's going on here? We're really driving people to talk more in, in the IT disciplines. We've been in a ton of meetings where you could tell these groups haven't been in a lot of meetings together, right? And you're trying to get a server out in five minutes with some thing that I got on this slide here, but really it's not going to happen until the people get together. So that's, a, I, I think, a key challenge of a virtualization. So you know, that's, that's a, leader, a, a management leadership issue. That's why I, I did the travel port example, because they really talked about that to say, how do I move my, my workers up to higher value jobs Right, because that's where I need them. Right? Um, I really don't believe that. But, no, you know, obviously it's, it's, no, Jim, I'm telling you right now, I can tell you, I can point to the gentleman who did it at Travel Port. It's not easy, but that's that's really where we want to do it. What was unique about them, they actually did it with the same people. A lot of people have eliminated the full-time equivalent cost, but couldn't move the same people up. That, that's certainly a challenge. But obviously, you're trying to do more with less and get your people doing stuff closer to the business. I think everyone would agree with that, right? So, um, but that's been a key part of it. Sure, the, the question. So you just talk about how yeah, you merge network people, server people, application people together to become the same function group. Uh, uh, no, no, I didn't, I didn't say that. I, I think though the cooperation between those groups to 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 maximize your virtualized environment. Most people say they have to it has to increase. Yeah, certainly. You know, you have a new six foot device coming out. You need to understand that it's also take your skill set really up. And then 
at this moment because you virtualize, so you are switch server pretty much physically is on the same you know chassis, right? So you need to understand how it other work. But network people still network people. I mean, server people still server people. You are talking about here. I say you, you now you 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 cross function server people also a part of network people. Network people part of server group. What what we've seen is the net, the, the knowledge circle grow around the people because our server folks and the communication too yeah. from both groups has has grown and those people are actually you know, we're we're doing this right now. Dennis Harry uh, our project and to get the communication. That's what I was asking if, if there's a you know. A, some sort of silver bullet that you can shoot through the crowd and make this happen. I wish the bullets. But you can't. And, and what's to, to educate both groups, this is sort of like a cross training, but uh, they sort of fall into the network folks. They're still networking, but they're talking more with the server group and vice versa. Yeah, and, but and for their me, circle of knowledge has grown. On both right, I mean, for me, it's on the same, okay, now with the virtualization, when I do my networking, I need to more understand the server part, right? But my responsibility is this on network part. On the other side, you know, frank speaking, I want to listen to any several people tell me, say, well, on network should be. We have yeah. a lot, the, the ser our server folks, they were very contained on their, just their space. Right, that right, was it. Yeah, yeah. Right now, they're doing more as far as IP, man, <coughs> DHCP, uh, <coughs> or, you know, VLANs and all this jazz. They understand it, they get it. And actually, we've got, we, we bought a box, uh, that, they're, that both groups are actually uh, uh, managing to, to get the IPs out. And, uh, and Lenny, this is where you know a partner like High Point can kind of help you make that transition and help you bridge the gaps, right? So, so oftentimes we'll do meetings with server storage and networking team, and and because we can speak the language across to all uh, across all the groups and bring those groups together so that we can work towards the common goal. So we can talk about that okay. offline. Okay. Uh, thank you. No, help me with the answer. I'm struggling there. <laughs> All right. I think they're, they're kicking me off here. So thank you for a few minutes, and we'll turn it over to Sean Fernetta. Thank you.